thing and that's it. Okay, let us pray before we start, all right? Today, we are going to look at inheritance, which is a very important part of uh, the Christian walk as well. Father, we give thanks to you. Thank you, God, that through Christ, oh God, that all the blessings, all the blessing, all the spiritual blessings in heaven, oh God, are for us, oh God. And therefore, we are able to set our minds on the things that are above and not on the things of the earth. Lord, you, when you came and spoke in the Sermon on the Mount, oh God, you said that blessed are the, those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Lord, you want our eyes to look at a place that you have promised us and given us as an inheritance, oh God. So, Lord, we pray that tonight, as we dive, dive into this uh, particular topic, Lord, we pray that you may open our eyes to see your truth, O oh God. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to your sight. Use your servant, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, we are going to look at inheritance, okay? Um, all right. Now, let's look at the lesson theme first. He says here that God redeems his people in order to bring them to the promised land. But this promised land is of his heavenly inheritance, where he will dwell with them for all eternity. Okay? So, God promised us that he will dwell with his people, his elect people, for eternity. And we can see that in the book of Revelation. But not just the revelation, but all throughout the Bible, we will see the same theme occurring again and again if we really pay close attention. And I hope that nowadays when you read the Bible, especially when you read the Old Testament, right, you would begin to see that as well. Okay, Let's look at the verse for tonight. Um, it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to verse 4, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Okay, he says that there is a living hope, a hope that does not die, a hope that, how, what kind of hope? The hope is that there is resurrection. Okay, through the resurrection of Christ, we see there's a resurrection from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. And this inheritance is kept in heaven for you. And I hope that this verse really, you know, helps us, especially when we are in the days of pandemic, in the days of uncertainty, in the days of people dying, in the days of possibility of, um, you know, our physical body are being destroyed or hurt, that there is uh, an eternal inheritance for every one of us who believe in Jesus. And that should be our great hope. All right? Now, um, let me say this thing, okay? At this point of our class, we would have already begun to see that when we come to a text, okay, one of the things that we must remember to do is that we must not only understand and interpret and apply the text itself. Now, many people, as I showed you in the, some of you who joined the Bible seminar, which will be happening again in the uh, uh, end of this month, right? Um, that some people, they just read the text and just use it for their daily use, like, a, you know, straight away apply it to themselves. But in order for us to appreciate the full wonder of the truth of God, we must read it against the backdrop of God's overarching big story. So, like, for example, if you read the story of, you know, one particular story, like this is, uh, I think this is uh, uh, Gideon and the Fleas, huh? So we read the Gideon and the Flea story. We cannot just look at this one particular story and say that, oh, I know this story. This is about, um, you know, you can, uh, uh, if you want to test God, uh, just test you something to test him. Lah. You know, give him some condition uh, and see whether uh, 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 any signs or not. You know, so some people, they, they make decisions based on any signs. Okay, not science, but signs. Okay. But they forgot that this particular Gideon story is embedded in a big story of the Bible. Right? Maybe this is only Judges, this part is only Judges, but there's many, 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 many more. 
So we got to look at the overarching big story of God in order to see this, interpret this part of the Bible, right? So in the same manner, I hope that uh, from now on, you would change the way how you read the Bible and interpret the Bible especially. Uh, don't simply jump to the conclusion and say that, oh, Gideon's story, yeah, 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 I know this is talking about give a fleece, like, give a sign, like. You know, and then you suddenly, those of you who come from a Chinese background, especially a Taoist background, uh, it's, not a, it's not something that's too hard, you know, for you to connect with importing from your Taoist background that, um, you know, it looks just more or less like the Pua Pui, uh, you know, those of you who, if you know what I'm talking about, those kind of casting lots, uh, you know. Um, no, it's not like that. So you miss out the whole big story. All right, so we got to look at the an overarching story. And for that, we need the whole Bible. We need the entire Bible. It comes to preaching, it's the same as well, all right? So we have been illustrating throughout our whole st study, both the need and the method for connecting the dots. You need to be able to connect the dots, especially the Old and New Testament, so that we can better understand and discern what is God's message in any given text or any given story that you read in the Bible, all right? Now, that this would be very important for understanding the place, especially now we're going to talk about the word promised land. Promised land. Huh? I know this promised land thing uh, has been very largely abused and misused nowadays in our, day, in our modern day church, churches, okay? Especially in Asia, this part of the world, where... Uh, in some countries like us, you know, owning land property is still very possible. You know, compared to other places like Hong Kong or Singapore, uh, it's very hard. But sometimes when we look at the property and then we connect straight away with the, pro the word promised land, which is a grave mistake, okay? Grave mistake. So we're going to look at it from the point of view of history, of the history of redemption of God. So when God redeems his people, in the story of his redemption, how does this word promised land sit within that story? And this is what we want to look at. And it concerns us a lot, a lot. For Christians, it concerns you a lot, a lot. Now, we're going to consider some of these questions, like why the land of Israel throughout the Old Testament? Why is it so featured so prominently? All throughout the Old Testament, you read about the land of Israel. There's a land there, all right? And how does it tie to the idea of inheritance? What is the theological significance of all of this for the Old Testament church? Now, once again, you shouldn't be surprised now when I talk about the term Old Testament church because when I talk about the Old Testament church or when I mention the word church, I'm not talking about the square church building or the you know, center of the art kind of uh, uh, building or architecture. I'm talking about the people of God the elect people of God, right? The chosen people of God. So the, in the Old Testament, was there a chosen people? Yes, all right? It's the same. The Old Testament church and the New Testament church is one church under Christ, right? Now, how, does, how do all these themes carry over in the New Testament? And how does the New Testament build upon them? And where do we find the ultimate, the ultimate fulfillment of the promised land. Where is the ultimate fulfillment of the promised land? So we're going to look at three major topics tonight. The first one is called the land of promise. The land of promise. So first of all, let's consider the land of promise, which is the basic theme we need to understand, or the promised land is the same. Now, originally, where was man given a land? Where was human given a land? The Garden of Eden, isn't it? He was the original territory that was given to Adam, a place where God dwelt with them, right? And God commanded Adam in, in, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, says what? You know, he says this, now notice here, say, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. You see the word subdue it? Subdue the earth. Subdue the ground, subdue the earth, right? And have dominion over every creature, rule over them, Right? Now, so that paradise, of course, we know as we go to chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Genesis, it was lost. Why was it lost? Because of sin. Because men fell into sin, right? But notice 
that the new land of promise, it also comes with a similar renewed call to take dominion over the land of Canaan. What was God telling the people of Israel when before they went into Canaan? Some of your Bible translation would say the word possess the land. What is possess? Take dominion, right? Subdue it, take dominion over the land of Canaan. And one particular thing that God was saying to the people of Israel is to purge the land of all the idol worshippers. Okay? And their idolatry. You've got to keep them all out. Get rid of them. Right? Uh, of course, that is when killing starts. Uh, and some people are finding it very, very... Um, um, very uh, uncomfortable with the idea that God calls people, God called his people to kill people. All right? Um, without a proper biblical understanding, without a proper biblical theology understanding, you will definitely make a mistake. And you will think that, oh, yeah, lah, God is so bad. God asked people to kill people. How can God be such a murderer? Right? Now, before you jump into that conclusion, what was the purpose of God purging that land out of all the idol worshippers and the idolatry? All right? Uh, I'm going to go on. Uh. I'm not going to stop there first. But if you have questions, later you can ask me or you can type in the chat box if you still cannot reconcile with the idea that how come God, who is so loving, can uh, raise up a people and in the process of raising up the people and giving them the land, he has to command them to kill the people. Okay, if you cannot wrestle with that, you cannot reconcile with that, you can type in your uh, chat box later, I will try to answer. But as you go on, keep that answer, keep that question in your mind, but you can still continue on the lesson and see what does it transpire at the end of today's lesson. Okay, now, God asked them to purge the land of the idol worshippers and the idolatry and to establish a holy dwelling place, a sacred place for the holy God. All right? Now, Moses had given them clear instruction, as you can see in Deuteronomy. Okay, if you just quickly read through, land your eyes there. In order to accomplish this, they were to conquer and completely destroy specifically seven wicked nations inhabiting the land and to make no covenant with them or to show mercy on them. They were to save nothing alive that breathes. Okay, nothing. And that meant all animals and all people. And they were not to save anyone alive, anything alive among the Hittites, the Gergeshites, or the Amorites, okay, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, the Jebusites, okay? Or some people say that uh, uh, they are all the parasites that need to be get rid of. <laughs> okay, the seven nations. Now, you see in Deuteronomy chapter 7 here, for any others in the land that's outside of these seven nations, okay, they were to kill the male, but save the women, the children, the cattle, and the spoil. All right? Bear that in mind, okay? Outside of these seven nations that are in the land, they are not supposed to kill the, the women and the children and the cattle and the spoil, but only the male. The purpose in all of this was to what? The big purpose over there is to establish a holy land for God's dwelling with his people. All right? Uh, if, you, if you see the word there, destroy, okay? If you check the word destroy, the word destroy is harem. Harem means you are giving it to God. Giving it over to God. Okay? You are not supposed to spare. This is a command. You must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them. Make no covenant with them and show no mercy, all right? Now, you will remember that God has called Abraham, including, uh, when he called Abraham, he included a land of promise, okay? In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. There was a land there. And he repeats this in the covenant, in his covenant with Abraham, uh, in five chapters down the road. All right, it says, the whole land of Canaan, where you now dwell or reside as a foreigner, I will give you an everlasting possession. My friend, if you can highlight or whatever, right, in your PDF, an everlasting 
possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. So this expectation was increased with Isaac, Jacob, and his sons. Now remember, Joseph bones, remember Joseph bone, right? Joseph told him that before you get out of Egypt, when God brings you back to the land, okay, when you get out of Egypt, you must remember to bring my bones out. Must, okay, he charged them. Now it was further intensified, of course, when Moses led them out of Egypt. And when they were on route or they were on the way to possess the land promised to them for over 400 years earlier, okay, to be exact, about 430 years. But the land was not an end to itself. It served as the, it served the promise to the seed. Okay, why? Joseph is whose seed? Jacob, Jacob's seed, right? Or Israel's seed, right? All right, so the seed is the priority. The seed has to be in that land. Because he says, God says, your descendants, your seed, right? So the land serves as an inheritance to them. It embodies God's covenant, right? My friend, when I talk to you about the seed, talk about to you the land and the promises, you should already be connecting to this word covenant. To embody God's covenant commitment, to dwell with them and among with his people, among his people. So the promise was personally applied through the division of the land into the allotment that is given to and to every tribe. If you if you have done your reading on Levit Leviticus, uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and if you slowly translating into Joshua, you would already have seen um, the land that is being divided according to the tribes. Right? To each tribe, they will assign a portion of their land or their allotment okay? to various families within the tribe. And this kind of arrangement is supposed to be a perpetual inheritance to be preserved. You cannot change it one. Okay? Once it is being set, it is being set forever. Now, there is also an exception to this principle, of course. We know that Aaron, Aaron the high priest, and his descendants, the Levites, they were not given any inheritance in the land. They don't have land to call their own. Why? Because their inheritance was to be the Lord himself, was to be God himself. Okay? And you see this in a few places. In Deuteronomy uh, chapter 18, verse 1 to verse 2, the Levitical priests are to have no allotment or inheritance with Israel. They shall live on the food offerings presented to the Lord for that is their inheritance. The Lord is in their inheritance. You look at verse 2. As he promised them. Okay? So the Lord is their inheritance. In other words, the food offerings presented to the Lord is God's one. So it's as if that God is giving them the food offerings as their sustenance. But ultimately, because of that, God is their inheritance. So this, their inheritance for this particular tribe because they serve in the temple or they serve in the tabernacle, who is their inheritance? They have the eternal inheritance, not a geographical inheritance. So the family of the priests, okay, they serve as a constant reminder that the promise of inheritance was never ultimately found in the geographical real estate land, but rather in the spiritual inheritance of Christ and his presence with his people, as we will see more in a moment's time. Okay, so there is a priest. And every time when you have the festival, you will be reminded that this priest, actually you don't need to wait, okay, because the Levites, like I told you the last few lessons, right, the last lesson, um, some of them, they are actually going into the entire land to be Bible study teacher or teaching them the law, right, teaching them to read the law and understanding the law. So whenever you see this group of people with their special costume or special vestment that they wear, you are reminded that your inheritance is not on this geographical real estate, but there is a, an ultimate eternal inheritance, right? Just now, God used, just now we read already, eternal possession, right? So you must also note the relationship of God's promise of both blessings and curses. And consequently, now once again, before I continue my sentence, huh? You heard the word just now, God's promise of blessings and curses. What does it remind you of? 
What should you be reminded of when I say these words? Blessings and curses, promises. What are all these languages? Okay, let's see. Yeah. Mm, Justin said already. Is it Shirley? Yeah, Justin. Okay, Justin. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, covenant. You're right. Okay. It's the word covenant. So you, whenever you see this, you must be re remind, remind yourself. This is the context of the covenant of grace as applied here in the land. So the promise has to be received by faith. You have to be you receive by faith with a believing and a responsive kind of obedience that God has made the covenant and he will keep his part. And therefore, I must also be, not be, I must also keep and observe the covenant. Be careful to obey. All right. So you see, this explains the 10 spies and the two spies. Those of you who do not know this story, yeah, just a very quick one. Before they get into the land of uh, uh, Jericho or the promised land, they have to pass through this place called Jericho. Okay, and Jericho has a very tall city wall. And Mo Joshua would, would uh, uh, send, uh, would send uh, um, 12 spies to go and spy out the land. Okay, it's like a, a land survey like that. But they are supposed to keep their identity uh, hidden. All right, so they sent the 12 spies and they came back, okay, uh, bringing some of the best fruits. You see the grapes over there. Huh? They show, wow, look at the grape. Oh, so much, you know, so abundant indeed. But, okay, 10 spies said that, you know, we, however, the land is flowing with milk and honey is true, but the people over there are too big. They are giant size. You know, they are XXXXXXL size. You know, we are like grasshopper in front of them. And it's too small for us to even go and uh, 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 conquer them. Okay. So when they said that, all the hearts of the people were melted. Uh, they were fearful and they started to doubt God. But only two, two smiles that gave a positive report and said, no, you know, with God, we are more than able to conquer them. What, are, what is all these things, you know? They are not even as, as, uh, as, uh, uh, as scary as what we have seen. If God can overturn uh, Egypt, such a big nation of the world, when we have nothing in our hands, no weapon, no nothing, but they, they have chariots, they have all kinds of weapons of their day, considered the more, most modern weapons of their day, and then God can actually defeat them. What is all this? so-called big size XXXXL exaggerated kind of giants over there in the land of uh, Canaan, all right? So we are more than capable, okay? So only two stood up. And so 10 people were unbelieving. Two, their names are Caleb and Joshua, right? When Moses sent them into, the, uh, 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 into Canaan to, to spy, right? So Joshua and Caleb. Now, they were the ones that are believing, and so it explains for us the cause for God's judgment in stripping Israel of the possession that was promised to them. Because the people, majority, they followed the 10 spies in unbelief. And so they made a breach of the covenant. They broke the covenant. They were covenant breakers. Therefore, they reaped the covenant curses that God has promised. And what was that? They suffered for 40 years in the wilderness, going around and round and round. And all of those aged 20 years and above, they died slowly, one by one, without ever enjoying the land. Okay? So you ask, you ask the question, huh? Only give bad report, only ma. Why so need to be so, so strict? No. To God, it is not just a bad report. God saw their heart. And their heart was unbelief. Remember the covenant of grace is for you to believe. Right? The promises is for you to be received by faith with a believing and responsive obedience. Okay? And so, uh, because of that, I mean, they missed it. They missed their trip. But Joshua and Caleb, the two spies who gave the positive report, they entered the land by faith just like how they embrace the covenant promises by faith. And notice the beautiful description of Caleb in Numbers chapter 14. 
He says that because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, uh, which means believing wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. You will also notice the emphasis on the fruit of obedience because of his obedience, right? At the beginning and the end of the book of Joshua, the book of Joshua chapter 1 you look at the verse on the screen that I highlighted. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Be, care be careful to do everything that is written in it. So I just, you know, remind a little bit just now. Huh? Sometimes you will see that. Huh? Don't think that majority wins, okay? Democratic doesn't mean that it is the best kind of way to go for. Huh? Sometimes majority voice, huh? Most of the time, you look at majority voice, uh, they are all wrong one. And because of the majority, uh, you listen to the majority, what will happen? It will shake your faith. You will miss, you know, that trusting. You will lose that trusting in God. Uh, sometimes, it is not, most of the time, you look at the Bible, it is not like that. Uh, if you want to look at the world, what, or you follow what the world says, okay, in order to, some people, they do church like that, you know, in order to be relevant to the world, you know. So we look at what is, what is the culture of the world, like we study, like, okay. Oh, majority of the young people are like, like this. So we also must follow, we also must uh, reach out to them, you know, in, in such a way that can easily, you know, uh, connect with them. No, God's way is not like that. God's way is not like that. God's way is not majority. So you, you come up with all kinds of strategy to go and, to go and uh, reach out, you know, in the name of reaching out. You make, you make things to become so palatable until when they come in, uh, they are cheated into the church. Because suddenly they realize that, oh, God actually uh, talks about discipline. Uh, oh, God, is, God actually talks about, God actually minds sin. Okay? That's a, a, a side note for application. But let me come back to here, Joshua chapter 1. Obey, obey, be careful to do everything that is written in it. What has God given us? What has God given us, the church, to build the church? God has not given us nothing. Some churches operate like as if God has given us nothing. You know, we have to go out to the world and search for the best strategy, the latest, most modern church growth plan or strategy, you know, uh, the way to communicate, the way to... Uh, build bridges, uh, the, the way to, uh, the, the steps to, the, to uh, 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 reaching out to the postmodern society and blah, blah, blah. You know, we study culture instead of any other thing. But any other thing we do, except what has been written, we don't study. We don't give careful attention. All right? Now, it has never changed. What God has given in the Old Testament is the same in the New Testament. What is written? Look at the end of Joshua. Be careful to obey all that is written. All that is written. Right? In the book of the law of Moses, without turning aside to the right or to the left. So as we have previously seen, you know, there is this distinction within the covenant people of God. A distinction between the visible church and those who are outwardly seen, the visible church, the people, and the invisible church where those uh, who are true believers, sometimes you will see those are outwardly seen. But the invisible church, those who are true believers, how can you see? You cannot see because we are human eyes, isn't it? Only God can see, right? But it's the same. You will see this all the time. This is also referred to in the places like Romans chapter 2. You know, it says what? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you, who even though you have the written code and circumcision are a lawbreaker. Uh, you are, have the written code, you will have circumcised, you know, a lot of things uh, in, in, uh, outside of you can be seen. But no, a person is a Jew, is a true Jew in a sense, who is one inwardly. And the circumcision is not an outward circumcision, it's a circumcision of the heart. By the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. This is the invisible church, the true believer. 
Okay, Romans chapter 9 also speaks the same, that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, obtained the promise, a righteousness that is by faith. Right? But the people of Israel, no. Why? Because they pursue it not by faith, not by believing, not by trusting God, but as if it were by works, by their own kind of hard work or by their own kind of strategies or intelligence. They stumble over the stumbling stone. So this most this important theological principle, this principle continues to bear significance in the remainder of the Old Testament until into the New Testament. So we also note that those who were originally, you know, seemingly outside of the covenant could be also brought into through faith. Those who were originally outside the covenant could be brought in through faith. One very clear example is the person, is the woman called Rahab. Rahab. Rahab is a Gentile. She is a prostitute, as the Bible says. But she is a notable example during this period when they are going into the promised land. Why? If you want to read about this, you can go to Joshua and read it. Okay, in the first few chapters of Joshua, it's a very interesting story over there. Okay, whereby he allowed the spies to escape. They, and basically, she, she protected the spies. Okay? Now, in Hebrews, the Bible gives a commentary. The Bible says that by faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Okay? Now, of course, we are not saying and building a doctrine here that God accepts. You no, know, God is okay if people become prostitutes. Or God is okay if we are morally loose or god is okay if you become immoral sexually no god is not saying that the bible is not saying that when the bible gives examples the bible is not necessarily encouraging you to be exactly that the person for example you see that um, abraham you know he he um you know in order for um, Sarah cannot wait for the son to come, right? So in order you know, for, for her to, to quicken or to, uh, to make God work faster, you know, she uh, found a very smart way to get her maidservant to sleep with her husband. All right? But it doesn't mean that just because it happened, it doesn't mean that all of us, uh, we must go and uh, 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 find other ways. You know? If you cannot have baby, never mind. Uh, find other woman and get baby. No, it's not like that. All right, don't, don't, be, don't be ridiculous, all right? But uh, one thing for sure here, for the case of Rahab, we are saying, you know, the Bible is saying that because when she saw what the spies did and knew about what are they doing, she trusted in the God who sends them. She trusted in the God. You can read in the, in the, in, in the book of Joshua. She heard about what God did first in Egypt. And the land was trembling in fear, right? You can read about that. Now, anyway, throughout their sojourning, throughout the Israelites, when they were going through in the wilderness, uh, stopping over in the wilderness, temporary staying in the wilderness, they were what we call the English word is sojourning. God still continued mercifully to set the gospel before them. Okay, there is a gospel over there that they could see that God is, you know, saving them through the sacrificial lamb, you know, not uh, with the substitutionary atonement, okay, because of that, God redeemed them by his grace, right, and then uh, guiding them and leading them, okay, unto the land where he can dwell with them, okay, so the reference is made to Israel in the wilderness in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2, it says, for we also had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did, who are the day, the day, those are who are in the wilderness, but the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. They did not have the same kind of trusting of those who obeyed God. So one example of the incident was that the bronze serpent. There is a bronze serpent story and you can read that in Numbers chapter 21. All right, You can see that uh, basically um, they were complaining they started to complain about Moses and they tell Moses, why you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Huh? And there's no food here, no water here. And we hate this kind of manna, you know? What kind of food is that? You know? And then 
And then um, verse, uh, okay, I think I jumped here. Okay. And then you continue verse 6. Uh, okay. It says, the Lord sent snakes among them to bite them. Okay. And a lot of people died. And then they finally came to their senses and said, no, sorry, we have sinned against God. We have complained against God. Please take the snake away. And jo Moses prayed for the people and God said to Moses, make the snake and put it up on the pole. Okay, a bronze snake. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on the pole. And then when people who, uh, who were bitten by the snake, they look at the bronze snake and they lift. All right? So this bronze snake thing is fulfilled in Christ. It was lifted up on the pole, isn't it? In John chapter 3, verse 14 to 15, Okay, Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Okay, so it is fulfilled. Can you see the Old Testament? How is it talking about Christ? How is it providing the framework about Christ? How is the Old Testament kind of like the fun run version? You know, the underage version before the real thing happens, before the, the, reality, the reality comes, the foreshadowing, you know, in the Old Testament, is a shadow. In the New Testament, we see the reality, or in Christ, we see the reality. And if you remember, um, so this is what? In the wilderness. This is in the wilderness, right? In the wilderness. And this will, in the wilderness, they are given the gospel. Did you see that? All right? So the gospel continues to be proclaimed in the wilderness. There's a good news that God does not wipe out everyone. God still saved. But the way is through the lifted up, the lifted up snake on the pole or the lifted up uh, symbol. Because it's not a real snake. It's a bronze snake, right? It's the lifted up symbol, right? That uh, whoever that see it or believe in it will have life. They will live. So Israel also, having broken the covenant through unbelief, right? They've broken the covenant, they disobeyed, but now they have to renew the covenant with God before they enter into the promised land under Joshua. And this, this was a confirmation of the covenant God has already made with them. And this is recorded in Joshua chapter 5, where Joshua also circumcised all the males. Uh, remember, the 20 and above one, they all died already. Now these are the 20 and below, and they continue to uh, journey on, and then uh, before they went into the promised land, God reminded them about his, uh, uh, by doing this circumcision. And what is the circumcision for? Anyone can tell me? What is the circumcision for? When you see the word circumcision of the flesh, circumcised, what is it for? You must remember, recall what word? Same like the promise, blessings and curses. What is the promise? What was that related to? What is the circumcision for? Anyone can remember? It is for what? For God to remind us about what? Yes, Vengeance, correct. Covenant again. You see? Okay. It is the sign of the covenant. You forget about that. Go back to the uh, Abraham story. Okay. 